These are the very first pictures ever taken of the remotest part of the northeast India, a vast tract of rugged hills and jungle virtually unexplored before the last war. Twenty years ago, the Indian government asked a young anthropologist, Christoph von Heimendorf, to visit this unknown region and report on the tribes who live here. He said he'd go, provided he could take his wife with him. So in 1944, the Heimendorf set out with porters they'd recruited from the foothills. This is how Mrs. Heimendorf looked 20 years ago. The man standing next to her is Cargo Bida, their guide. There were many obstacles on the way, deep, fast-flowing rivers. The Heimendorfs crossed them on bamboo rafts made on the spot. There were no bridges, no boats, and the rafts were dragged across between long cane ropes fastened to either side. Soon they got to higher ground and left the forest behind them. This was the upland country of rolling hills, and here lived the Apatani tribe, the tribe which the government asked them to find. The Heimendorfs had heard rumors of the savage ferocity of the Apatanis, and the government had originally wanted them to travel with an armed escort. They thought it would be better if they went by themselves. An unarmed man and his wife would hardly arouse suspicion, but they still wondered what sort of reception they'd get when they first saw the Apatani village. Our porters were strangers up here and obviously nervous. We'd hardly put up our tent when they crowded around wanting to be paid off and anxious to get back to the safety of their own villages. To them money was useless and we had to pay them with some of the precious goods they'd carried all this way. Goods which we'd wanted to use as presents, cotton cloths and salt. We were very careful to see that every porter got his fair share. Now the Heimendorfs were on their own, and they made their way cautiously into the village. They were the first white people the Upper Tarnies had ever seen. At first the crowds were shy and inquisitive, but then Mrs. Heimendorf noticed everyone, even the children, were smoking pipes. She made friends very quickly by giving away her own supply of cigarettes. It all seemed well for the moment. But there were still some more important Apatanis who didn't come forward. The women were all torn between curiosity and shyness, but eventually their inquisitive natures got the better of them, and presence of salt convinced them everything was all right. But soon the Heimendorfs found the cigarettes and the other guests went... For 20 years, India started pushing her administration into the northeastern border country. The dispute with China gave the area great strategic importance, and it was therefore close to travelers. We never thought we'd ever see it again. Then, a short time ago, when I was passing through Delhi, I saw a chart. The Indian government gave us permission to go back to visit the same Apatani village. They found themselves in a Dakota heading northeast. First, they flew along the snow ranges of the Himalayas to the plains of Assam. Then a special flight took them over the jungle and foothills in a few minutes. Twenty years before, the journey had taken days on foot. Some of the fields around the village had been turned into a rough airstrip. And now there were frequent flights bringing in government people and stores almost every day. The Heimendorfs knew they wouldn't find quite the same isolated village. But we still wondered how the valley had reacted to modern intrusion. The first wheel the Apatanis had ever seen was an aircraft wheel. But did they use the wheel now? Had they adopted the plow? But of course, the biggest question was, would they in fact remember us? The valley looked exactly as though down when we last saw it. 
The news of our arrival had gone on ahead, and the children ran in from the fields to tell their parents we were here. <laughs> it was very moving for us to meet old friends. We recognized all the old faces, and they recognized us. But perhaps they weren't very tactful in their first reaction. You've grown so old, they said. You've grown so old. And as before, the women wondered why I didn't make myself as beautiful as they were with their decorative rose plugs. <laughs> For the younger ones, it was exciting to see almost a legend. The older people had always told them of the first white people who came to their valley, and everybody crowded round to see for themselves. <laughs> Twenty years after their first visit, the Heimendorfs found that everything came back very quickly. The names, the words, and they found too the same streets, the same bamboo verandas, the same smells, and of course the same curiosity. <laughs> And this curiosity followed them wherever they went in the village with their interpreter. The Apatanis weren't just generous, they were practical, and they told their guests they'd build them a house. Soon, all the men had set to work fashioning posts and weaving bamboo mats for the floors. <laughs> And while all this was going on, the boys chanted as they brought in more building wood from the forest across the valley. The Apatanis are an agricultural people, but land is scarce. And they've only been able to feed themselves by very efficient rice planting. The fields are irrigated by channels and dams and each spring the children help to clear them out and level the terraces with sledge-like trays. The workers wallow day after day in the cold mud of the paddy fields. There are no other tools, and even the strengthening of the clay boundaries is done by hand. A special clay is used in pottery, but the method is very primitive. After the first moulding, the potter hammers out the shape, holding a round stone inside. Apatanis are experienced weavers, but unlike the potters, their skill is highly sophisticated. The cotton thread is dyed in various colours, and the cloth isn't just made for their own use, they barter quite a lot of it with neighboring tribes for pigs and chickens. <laughs> Perhaps pottery and weaving are just what you'd expect to find here. But there are stranger sides to the Apatani character, curious, magical, and frightening. An old woman's primitive surgery. Her patients have come for bloodletting, and they submit their affected limbs to the suction of a bamboo tube while they wait. The blood oozes into the tube, and the doctor then comes round to collect it. But times have changed for the Apatanis. Their village is now linked to a township and a modern hospital by a jeep track they helped to make. The Indian government felt they had responsibilities towards their more isolated subjects, and they made the township the administrative centre for the whole district. Technical progress is creeping into the valley, and new roads have cut travelling times from weeks to hours. Education and law and order have been brought in by special corps of government officers, all young and enthusiastic. There's even a school where Apatani children learn about the outside world. They're taught, 
first in their own language, then in Assamese, the language of the plains, of the life which comes nearer every day. And like all schoolwork, it has its lighter side even if we have to march to get there. The Indian teachers have introduced the discipline and games they themselves once learned from their British rulers. Football. Here it's played barefoot with a mixture of tribal dress and modern shorts. Handball in the village is an older game. There are no rules and no goals. Only a pig's bladder is tossed about between anyone who wants to play. But while the children have time to play, some of the men are building a sort of platform. Enormous boards carried in single pieces from the giant trees of the forest are lifted onto wooden posts. The men say they're preparing for their great spring festival, which comes to each village in the valley once every three years. The platform is a place of assembly, a pub, a town hall, a courthouse, all at the same time. But most important of all, a place of worship. <laughs> In fact, the platform is the center of village life. Disputes are settled there, and at festival time, animals are tied to the platform while the priests who sit above prepare for the sacrifice by chanting incantations, sometimes all day long. <laughs> Next to the platform, a strange trophy hut. There used to be gruesome war trophies in it, the eyes and hands of enemies killed in battle. Although the government stopped tribal fighting now, the hut is still a starting point for ritual processions. The festival starts with sacrifices. Pigs are brought to be blessed, rather unwillingly. Then they're taken to a special shrine where another priest in ceremonial robes prays to the gods for good crops. The pigs are then anointed and slaughtered. Anointing is always the first part of a sacrifice. The more well-to-do Apatanis offer a bullock, and by giving the meat away according to ancient rules, they hope to gain social prestige or keep up with the Joneses. But everyone has to give something. Cattle are only kept for prestige and sacrifice. They're never milked or harnessed. After the priest's blessing, the bullock is led to its owner's house and the whole village gathers round excitedly to watch the sacrifice. The priest stands above the scene on the veranda chanting prayers. After the slaughter, the priest scatters to the winds the feathers from a live chicken and calls on the spirits of the fields and forests to bless the donor's household. By this time, hundreds of people had arrived for the festival. There were even some of their old enemies, the Daftlas, too. Obviously, the excitement was for something special, but what was it? What was going to happen? What was the climax of the festival? And then they thought they'd found the answer. The whole village was busy hauling upright an enormous pole. But 
Why all this energy? What could be done with a cross between a television aerial and a maypole when there wasn't any electricity? How did this come into the festival? As soon as the pole was upright, everyone held it steady by taking the strain on the hundreds of ropes splayed out around it. Large flat boards were driven into the ground to hold it into position. Whatever they were doing, it was obviously important, something everyone helped with and was interested in, something that was a great deal of trouble, but the Heimendorfs, and apparently even some of the visitors, were still puzzled. <laughs> They were amazed to see one brave man volunteer to climb to the top, at least 70 feet up, and unfasten the ropes which had been used to pull it up. But the whole contraption still looked very shaky. The ropes were coiled up and stowed away, leaving only one attached to the pole itself. <laughs> Everyone was dressing up. For Apatani men, the fashion was a horizontal brass pin through a plaited knot above the forehead. <laughs> and the tails were rewoven. All the Apatanis wore them. They're woven from scarlet cane attached to a belt which is never taken off. <laughs> Some of the guests looked as though they had some special part to play, as though they could have been priests or wrestlers or athletic challengers. They gathered with the others towards the middle of the village and the center platform around which the festival rites were to be celebrated. <laughs> Rice beer was flowing wildly, and the drumming had a frightening note about it. They all waited. This was the climax, a childish joy in performing aerial gymnastics 30 feet above the ground. A great deal of work had gone into this pole game. The preparations had meant time and trouble and disciplined cooperative effort by all the villagers. The athletes were a few of the Apatani young men, but obviously in their sport they were doing more than just proving themselves. <laughs> Professor Heimendorf found none of the Apatanis could tell him why they were doing what they'd always done in these festivals for hundreds of years. They just said, this is the way it's done, the way it's always been done. Like most primitive people, the Apatanis can't give a reason for the central rituals of their community. It may be a form of sympathetic magic. As the crops are expected to shoot up and the years sway in the wind, so the young men swing high up into the sky. But this sympathetic magic is their own unknown secret, and no one else really knows the link between rope swinging and prayers for good crops. <laughs> Apatani life seems as if it will go on as long as it has done, but the invasion of the outside comes faster every day. If the Heimendorfs ever return, and they say they'd like to, 
the children won't be quite so curious, and perhaps in another 20 years this pole game will have disappeared. After a school education, the Apatanes will have other interests and ambitions outside the valley.